the quarter to pour those off. We ready to go, Fanny. Okay. Thank you, Galicia. Welcome and thank you for joining us today for the meeting of the New York City Health and Hospital Capital Committee. Today's meeting is officially called to order. First, I would like to propose a motion to adopt the minutes of the Capital Committee meeting held on May 14, 2020. I will be polling each member individually for his or her vote. Jose Pagan? Uh, yes. Approve. Dr. Katz? Yes. Dr. Katz? Yes. Um, can you not hear me? Uh, no, we were not, but now we can hear you okay. Okay. Uh, Frida Wan? Yes. Sally Hernandez Pinero? Yes. Thank you. So um, the motion is carried. Uh, next, we will hear from our senior vice president, um, uh, Ms. Flaherty, please. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Chair. Person Pinamora and Chair Pagan and Capital Committee. Despite these challenging times where it feels like the only certainty is uncertainty, our OFD department continues to persevere in close collaboration and consultation with our facility and central office leadership teams. Today's four construction resolutions, one major design resolution, and one license agreement are a culmination of efforts by our bidding team led by Ricky Tullock our design and construction team led by Oscar and Gonzalez, and our real estate and legal teams with a big thanks to Leora John Teff and Jeremy Berman. Over the course of, our, of the summer, our directors of engineering and union trade staff in our facilities have continued pandemic resiliency efforts in installing a, additional physical barriers for our staff and patients, enhancing our air exchange rates and adding HEPA filtration where possible, increasing our dialysis capacity in potential surge areas, and increasing oxygen outlets in specific areas of concern. Manny and our operations team has supported the vision of our facility leader CEOs, and we continue to be in the ready to deploy our resources for the unknown. Meanwhile, our planning, design, and construction unit has completed a large portion of FEMA work and additional batch of CARES projects to further prepare our facilities for an increase of potential COVID-19 patients. In partnership, with Gotham leadership, Michelle Lewis and her team, uh, another emergency program led by Senior Director Starlene Scott with Oscar is our emergency uh, program being constructed by DDC that is nearing completion in the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Queens. This, these are our COVID centers of excellence. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, New York City Health and Hospitals selected the, these three sites to build primary care clinics to fill the gap of limited primary care services and other safety net health resources available in these communities. These same neighborhoods also experienced an increased disease burden from the pandemic caused by historical poor health outcomes and other social determinants of health. The COVID centers of excellence are specifically designed to be responsive to the emerging needs for COVID-19 survivors and reduce demand on the closest public hospitals in those communities, Elmhurst, Lincoln, and Woodhall, to allow the hospitals to focus on more acutely ill patients. These substantial projects are expected to open beginning in the fall in the Bronx and into the winter. The three sites will offer COVID recovery service to address the unique conditions affecting many survivors of COVID, including specific evidence-based pulmonary and cardiology evaluation and treatment, mental health, and other specialized care for certain chronic conditions that have been altered by the effects of the virus. Now more than ever, oh, sorry, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Thank you. Additionally, now more than ever, housing our most vulnerable homeless patients will remain a steadfast commitment of health and hospitals. We look forward to presenting our first potential supportive housing development in collaboration with HPD for a second phase of Communal Life 2 at Woodhall Hospital in October. Earlier this month, myself and our AVP of Housing and Real Estate, Leora John Teff, met with the commissioner of HPD and her team as we look at opportunities to partner to expand housing access in additional ways in the city for our patients. We look forward to these important partnerships to support our high utilizer patients 
that could lead healthier lives if provided housing. Under the leadership of our supply chain team, our office continues to work hard at increasing our MWBE participation. In August, I presented upcoming opportunities to the local chapter of the National Association of Minority Contractors through a Zoom meeting with our team. There were over 100 participants on the call. Recently, we've seen a major increase in bidders for our public solicitations, which these resolutions will show including many MWBE firms as primes, and all, uh, all bids are coming in with robust MWBE plans, often higher than the 30% goal. Where prior, COVID, prior to COVID, we had bids, we were receiving bids of two to four, we are now opening bids with 12 to 17 vendors. Bid values are also lower, and we continue to work hard to ensure our low bidders are ready and prepared to work for our system. Under Heather McCreary's leadership in supply chain, we have conducted two MWBE closed pool solicitations over the course of the last six months that will be supporting our 50 Water Street consolidation. And we are continuing to identify opportunities for MWBE firms. Our CM solicitation, which had been on hold due to the pandemic, is back on track. And Oscar Gonzalez is leading that process with supply chain. We expect to present the, uh, the results of that solicitation to the board in November. It inv involves looking at 19 submissions, including multiple MWBE primes. We appreciate the committee's understanding and allowing us to present this resolution in November for contracts that expire in December. Uh, we want to ensure that we have additional firms able to support the system and we will be increasing the pool of firms from five to seven. So thank you for your patience and we're happy to have any questions on that. I wanna thank the committee for your time and your feedback throughout the course of the summer as we look to get ourselves back to normal and continue to persevere and prepare for the fall into the winter. Thank you. Thank you, Christine, uh, for your uh, summary of the activities. I just want to say um, that uh, we have been very impressed with your work and your team. Um, you know, it has been very challenging times for all of us, and particularly uh, your uh, team has raised to the occasion supporting the needs of the programmatic needs of the uh, whole system. So thank you. And I also would like to thank you and your team for continue to do that at the same time that you continue to further the goals that were established pre-COVID. So um, please uh, send uh, our most uh, heartfelt, uh, sincere thanks to all the members of your team. Um, is, there any, is there any question or, or comments about Christine's summary? Uh, we just go through the, um, the members of the board, Jose. Sonny, I just want to, uh, you, you, you said it, you said it very well. And I, I'll add that, uh, Christine, the work done on the uh, COVID centers of excellence, the way you are all thinking about planning for something that could happen or in better prepare is, is pretty impressive. I've, I've enjoyed working with you over the summer, uh, and Fanny and everybody else on the board to, to sort of like, uh, uh, discuss what are the plans. Um, the, also the Woodhall project, very, very exciting uh, and interesting. And uh, just, you know, we're, I'm so happy about the work that uh, you are all doing uh, to, the, the, despite all the difficulties that we're facing. So thank you, Fanny. And thank you, Christina. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Uh, Dr. Katz, any comments or? Sorry, I uh, had a little okay. trouble on meeting. I would just add and, and thank you, uh, Fanny and Jose, for noticing that if the hospital CEOs were here, you know, they would be cheering for uh, Christine's team. Um, they really feel that now, whether it's because something goes wrong, which sometimes happens in aging facilities, her team is there right away. Uh, Manny is there, you know, within minutes trying to help um and that uh for the new things that she always has a her team a creative idea of how to solve problems and so you know the she really sees she and her team really see the facilities as the customer 
and get out there for the sake of the patients about making whatever changes and improvements need to happen. So thank you for noticing. Thank you, Mitch. I, I just would like to add that, you know, we just also noticed the culture that you have fomented throughout the whole system of partnership. And I think Christine is, of course, emblemic, but we also would like to thank you for creating that culture of support and collegiality among all the units in the, um, in the system. So thank you, Mitch, for everything you have been doing. Of course, free COVID, during COVID, and now after the lockdown. So thank you so much for creating thank such you, a wonderful Sally. culture. Thank you. Uh, uh, now, uh, Frida, any comments? Not to pile on, but I think um, you you all have have said um, basically expressed it how I feel. I think it's incredibly impressive, Christine. We've talked about this in the past. Your team has been um, just amazing, and how important. You, you, and Mitch described it. You know, responding immediately and and being very creative in your solutions. I know you also think about the financing side and how to maximize dollars there and, and use that. Um, most efficiently, and so I, I, I commend you for that as well. And I just want to say I'm incredibly impressed by your outreach to the community, the um, vendor community, the suppliers, the, the um, contractors, and, and the statistics that you just reported on are, are quite amazing. And it's so important in this time to be expanding that pool and, and get, getting opportunities and getting people in, in and working and giving, you know, helping us do what we need to do. So thank you for your focus on that. In, in the midst of all of this as well, you and your team. Thank you. Thank you, Frida. I, and I, I just would like, and sorry that I'm adding to almost every comment, but uh, some of the things that I also have uh, been able to observe Christine do is like really trying to uh, position health and hospital as a client of choice. And I think this outreach to the contracting community, to the professional services community, and now in particularly, which, you know, there is a tough economy and now there are vendors that are looking at health and hospital as a client that they may not have been looking before. I think Christine and her team are making sure that you are using this opportunity to create um, the partnership to ensure that um, the system is able to deliver for all the units. So I really would like to uh, thank also Christine for helping ensure that a health and hospital becomes a client of choice for all those uh, service providers. Yeah. Uh, Sally? You don't have to say up? I can't just sit here. <laughs> I, I'm the last Kylie. I want to say that um, everyone had extraordinary demands during the pandemic, but the physical demands on your folks were really extraordinary. And uh, you rose to the occasion and now we come before you and we can see that in the interim very short period of time you've been working on old initiatives or initiatives you started as well as new initiatives um and looking at our current agenda um you know you're you're there for the hospitals all the way christine so i do want to thank you and your folks along with everyone else Thank you, Sally. Uh, now, uh, if there are no further comments, um, we have a number of uh, resolutions to consider. <laughs> and so, uh, Ms. Flaherty, um, you have the floor. Thank you. Good morning. So our first resolution, as it is coming up on the screen, is requesting authorization for New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation, NYC Health and Hospitals, to execute a contract with BA Global Construction Corporation, the contract door, for an amount not to exceed $7,143,946 for construction services necessary for the reconstruction of the exterior facade rehabilitation at Health and Hospitals, Woodhall Hospital Center, the facility with an 8.5% project contingency of $712,299 for unexpected changes in scope, yielding the total authorized expenditure of $7,856,245. Um, good morning. I think now the presentation is visible. Uh, I believe 
Uh, my colleagues from Woodhull are on the line for, for purposes of question and answer, Lisa, Scott, McKenzie, and Ricardo. Um, let's get started. So the background here is that uh, Woodhull Hospital, which as a structural, as an engineer, I love Woodhull Hospital and how it looks. You can see the structure from the outside. Okay, so uh, hold on. Up, I mean, just... from, for purposes of question and answer, Lisa Scott McKenzie and Ricardo. Um, okay. Let's get started. So the background here is that uh, Woodhull Hospital. Okay. I think you have to mute, Lisa. Okay. There is Woodhull. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start uh, again. So the facade of Woodhull Hospital needs some work. Um, the exterior facade, which was constructed in the late 70s, um, it requires a number of areas that have been deemed unsafe structurally and, re and an extensive sidewalk shed is already installed at the hospital. Joint sealants and gaskets and the steel paneled facades have deteriorated and are in need of replacement. And the face bricks have cracked and mortar joints have deteriorated, also requiring new pointing. The steel sheeting soffit and column panels have rusted and cracked and there's several windows that require replacement. A number of railings throughout the hospital also have to be restored and replaced. Next slide. Other, um, I think. In order to comply with these requirements, we, we initiated design services and the design is complete for this scope of work. And so those design documents were sent out to the market and sourced via a public bid. The public bid resulted in 12 bidders bidding on the work and BA Global Construction Corporation is our lowest bidder. This is an MBE firm, and um, they also identified a 37.2% subcontractor MWBE plan. The uh, BA Global will be uh, self-performing 62% of the work, and the um, MWBE plan is listed here on slide floor, and the subcontractor MWBE utilization plan demonstrates a over $2 million participation from subcontractors, as well as the work being self-performed by BA Global. This project, it once uh, initiated and registered with the controller, would be expected to be completed in 2022. In looking at uh, BA Global Construction Corporation, it was exciting to see that this is a company with experience as a subcontractor, as well as a prime, and their experience with health and hospitals actually started as a subcontractor. And now they've, they're building their capacity to the extent of being able to complete a project such as this. Based on three evaluations uh, received, um, we had ratings that included excellent. They, they did not have a prime um, rating within Passport because they uh, haven't done substantial prime work, but uh, we did call many evaluations to determine their um, ability to, to get this work done and all of the ratings were positive. Next slide. This shows you the project budget for um, the overall funding for this project, which is an $8.2 million um, project funding. The construction is listed there, the award, the design services, as well as the available contingency at the, oh, the, the beginning of this construction of $712,000. So this is our resolution, which I read as the slide uh, was coming up. And uh, there's language here to, again, repeat the uh, project budget and the budget breakdown. At this point, I think we'd be ready to take any questions. Thank you, Christine, for your presentation. And particularly, I'm quite impressed with this uh, presentation and your um, comments uh, with respect to the 
contractor that they have been performing sub uh, work and now are taking on as a prime work. So I think this is a, a very good story um, in terms of the NWB community. So thank you. Um, and I, I'm, I'm very glad to see this type of progress. Um, so now I'm going to uh, ask each member of the board for any questions or discussions with respect to this resolution. Um, Jose Pagan. Uh, Jose? No questions, thank you. Okay, thank you. Dr. Katz? No questions. Thank you. Frida? Question. Thank you, Penny. So thank you. Uh, Sally? A quick question. Did this come before the committee once before, and is this a continuation of the construction process, or is this a new building? So this is a, this is a construction bid. Uh, so this has not become, this specific project at this location hasn't come before this committee before. However, we do have a large portfolio of facade projects where um, I think the most recent facade project with similar uh, dilapidated outside was uh, the, the T building at Kings County. But this specific one to help Woodhall Hospital has not come before the committee in the past. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, if there are no further questions or discussions, I would like to propose a motion to approve this resolution for submission to the board. Um, I will go through each one of the members uh, for the vote. Uh, Jose? Uh, yes. Uh, Mitch? Yes. Frida? Yes. Uh, Sally? Yes. The motion is carried. Thank you. Um, uh, Christine? Thank you. Good morning. So this project is for Gempo, Gemco Electric. Uh, I believe on the line we have Dr. Kana from Lincoln Hospital. Uh, we have two different uh, construction resolutions uh, associated with Lincoln Hospital. This is for um, the project background for why this project is required. Um, Lincoln Hospital is not in compliance with NFPA codes that require a separation of uh, th the three branches of electric system, critical life safety and equipment branches, they are required by code to be separated. So this, re this involves the red outlets the, that help uh, tie to medical equipment and patient rooms, exit signs, emergency lighting, and all of the medical equipment that's so important to save lives every day at Lincoln Hospital. Next. In order to get into compliance, a substantial amount of electrical work is required at our hospitals. The existing panels at the main electric switchgear rooms has mixed wiring at the life safety critical equipment branches, and it causes disruption to the operation of the emergency department, surgical department, and all hospital intensive care units. This work is incredibly uh, invasive in that it has to be done in collaboration with our hospital uh, staff with the contractor, and so it involves a tremendous amount of careful phased work over a period of time. So this uh, project was designed and it was sent to public bid. Uh, Gemco, this was a bid that happened ahead before COVID hit us, and uh, there were four bidders at the time of this uh, procurement. Gemco Electric Contractors was the lowest responsible bidder, and they presented an MWBE plan of 30% with all of the uh, MWBE providers listed here. Uh, Gemco is a GC and electrical contractor who does a large amount of projects for health and hospitals, both jacks as well as hard money bids. The contract amount here is $5,188,300. And the MWBE utilization plan is one, over $1.5 million. This project is scheduled to be completed in 2021. Based on evaluations in MOCs, both by Health and Hospitals and DEP, we found res uh, ratings that included excellent and good submitted for GEMCO. Next. Here sh shows the project budget. 
Um, I will point out that the project contingency varies per project because of the fact that we're not sure exactly where the bids are going to come in. So in this case, uh, we have a 12% project contingency available based upon the $5.1 million bid and a total project funding of $6.3 million. So now I'll read the resolution that we are requesting. We're requesting uh, this resolution authorizing the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation, NYC Health and Hospitals, to execute a contract with Gemco Electrical Contractor Inc., the contractor, for an amount not to exceed $5,188,300 for electrical upgrade services necessary for the hospital essential electrical system at New York City Health and Hospitals Lincoln, the facility with a 12% project contingency of $778,245 for unexpected changes in scope, yielding a total authorized expenditure of $5,966,545. Thank you, Christine. Um, I just have a question um, before opening up for all the members. Um, here you use the terminology project uh, contingency. Is that because you foresee that there may be some expenses, as you're saying here, in design, testing, and filing? Or uh, do you expect this contingency only to go to construction? I think that we would, we could, depending on the nature of an unforeseen condition, we could run into a situation where our additional engineering may be required. And so we're calling it a project contingency, one to be consistent, um, recognizing that some changes at times would result additional costs beyond just the contractor. Okay, Th Dep thank you. Um, thank you. So I would like now to, um uh, ask for the members if they have any questions uh jose no questions thank you uh mitch no questions thank you uh frida i just have one question christine gemco is also a requirements um one of our requirements contractors right is that yes that's correct Okay, and so it, to, this is a large job of specific project, and that's why we wouldn't use it through the requirements process. Is that kind of how it works? Correct. Um, right. We try to uh, we try to keep the scope of the JOX contracts anywhere from uh, under a million dollars to one to two, depending on uh, you know the specific project and how urgent it is. But we do try to send out to bid as much as possible to the market for larger scale complex work. And this is an example of that. Okay, that makes total sense. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Frida. Uh, Sally? No questions. Uh, I would like to follow up on Frida's question. Um, you know, talking about the contractor, sometimes um, uh, owners are concerned about capacity of the contractors if they are doing a lot of jobs uh, within the same organization. Um, um, was this, consider during the um, evaluation? This bidder had to demonstrate they had capacity. Um, they also are going to have to submit a bond associated with the work. Um, and, and that vetting demonstrated this firm could perform the work. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, uh, if there are no further questions, um, I would like to propose a motion to approve this resolution for submission to the board. I will poll each member individually for uh, his or her vote. Um, Jose? Yes. Uh, Mitch? Yes. Frida? Yes. Sally? Yes. The motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, Christine, the next Thank resolution. Thank you. So our next resolution will be requesting um, authorization to enter into an agreement for uh, the underground storage tanks at Lincoln Hospital as part of our energy program. And so Cyril has joined us, who leads our energy team. He's here on my left. I think you're visible right. And this provides a project background. Um, Lincoln Hospital currently has four 50,000 gallon number two fuel oil underground storage tanks. They also have two $10,000 10, gallon. Uh, diesel uh, underground storage tanks. These tanks are past their useful life and they require substantial replacements. 
They, this also ties into other energy efforts at the hospital, and uh, the tanks themselves uh, have require leak detection system. The, we have currently violations for these tanks with DEC that we need to replace these tanks as quickly as we can and appropriately as we can. And the new project will reduce uh, the amount of tanks and the amount of volume we have on the campus, which is good, and also improve um, what is where. Uh, and so uh, this will involve both decommissioning the existing tanks as well as installing brand new tanks at a location adjacent. So um, let's go to the next slide. This shows you a diagram of what is being um, replaced. The, oh, help me out here, Cyril. The blue is the old. Thanks, Christine. Within uh, plant, plant B, because the, the, the site is divided into two plants, plant B, we will allow the existing uh, tanks to remain and plant, and on that same plant, we will be installing uh, two new uh, 30,000 gallon tank, along with a 25,000 uh, gallon uh, diesel tank on plant B. On plant A, we will be removing the old tank and installing a new 25,000 gallon diesel tank. Thank you, Sarah. Next slide. So I did want to provide a little context uh, to this resolution in that it's a little different in that uh, we utilize uh, New York Power Authority to help us deliver a number of energy projects under an encore agreement that the city has with New York Power Authority. And so this project is being executed by the New York Power Authority. These encore agreements serve a number of organizations <clears throat> across the city, health and hospitals, CUNY, DCAS, and uh, DOE, Department of Education. And so in this case, um, NIPA hires construction management firms and designers and contractors. And so the bidding in this case was actually delivered by NIPA, but we are um, sharing all of the information so you have a sense of the project and the awardees in this case. Next slide. So NIPA has on their team for this project a construction management firm, Guth DeConzo, and that construction management firm acquired through NIPA's uh, processes a, a competitive bidding process. There were four bidders that are listed here, and the lowest qualified bidder was Dynamic US. Uh, NIPA has an active supplier diversity program and has 30% MWBE goals, similar to our goals. Uh, Dynamic US is the lowest responsible bidder of the four bidders. They had a 33.6 subcontractor utilization plan, and we've listed out the uh, three firms associated with the MWBE plan. Below is the construction contract amount as well as the MWBE amount. The projected completion date for this project is December of 2022. And we did pull evaluation information about Dynamic. They had a substantial amount of long history with DEP, which makes sense. They have a lot of tanks at DEP. And so we saw a number of ratings, good, good, and excellent, submitted uh, for Dynamic within the MOX system. This shows you the project budget, the breakdown of the project, uh, totaling the $19.6 million, uh, design, construction, bonds, project contingency, construction management uh, fees, the project management uh, fee, as well as, as well as interest during the course of construction. So this is a resolution authorizing New York City Health and Hospitals, NYC Health and Hospitals to execute a customer installation commitment, CIC, with the New York Power Authority, NIPA, for an amount not to exceed $19,645,521, including a 10% contingency of $1,449,777. For the planning, design, procurement, construction, construction management, and project management services necessary to install new underground storage tanks 
at New York City Health and Hospitals, Lincoln. Any questions? Thank you, uh, Christine. Um, we would like to open up for questions to the um, uh, committee. Uh, Jose? I don't have any questions. Thank you. Uh, Mitch? No questions. Uh, Frida? Um, Christine, thank you. It was very helpful for the explanation with NYPA. So I just want to make sure I understand um, the relationship. So we're entering into a a contract with NIPA for this specific project that is sort of governed by the Encore too. Is that how to think that's about correct. it? That's correct. Yeah, okay. that's correct. So like the project management fee to NIPA, is that something that is in with embedded and standardized in the in the um, in the Encore relationship or is it something that we you know do on a transaction by transaction basis? Uh, it's embedded uh, within the Encore agreement, and there are different percentages depending on the the size of the project. Okay. The night plus cost. Got it. And then the interest during construction is the interest on NIPA's part because we're not being charged interest on the geo bonds, right? Is that where, where does interest? Oh. Well, the process how it works is that um, NIPO pays out uh, to the construction, uh, uh, to the contractor as the, 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 you know, different phases of the project is completed. And so this outlay of funds, uh, you know, re relates to some interest for that initial uh, payment that has been, um, you know, disbursed to, to contractors. And currently they are using, I, I think around a 4%, which is extremely high right. uh, interest um, charge, but generally uh, because of the way uh, health and hospital reimburses uh, New York Power Authority, the interest during construction is, is minimal at the end of the project. So this is just an estimate, estimated amount and it's, it's basically whatever their the actual interest charge is. Is that yes? It's estimated around amount for the duration of the project, the two year duration of this project. That's estimated, uh, just an estimated amount. Okay. Um, okay, uh, that's helpful. I think it's an it. it I guess that the general encore relationship is. It makes sense to have NIPA doing all of this and you know, us having them as our project manager, is that? Yeah, it, it, it's very helpful. And um, they have kind of experts around energy oriented projects. Uh, DCAS is kind of the master negotiator mm -hmm. for the Encore agreements. And so there are certain aspects of the terms that we are kind of sub recipients to, I would say. Um, and then we, we execute um, MOUs with DCAS to acknowledge the Encore agreements. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank, Frida. Thank you, Frida. Um, Sally? Sally, do you have any question? I think you're muted, Sally. Can you hear me? Now I can, we can hear you. Okay, can you uh, hear me now? Yes, now, yes. Fantastic. Um, I had two questions. One on the evaluations, there were two goods and an excellent. And I don't know um, when you look at the bidders, let's say the next lowest bidder had three excellents. Uh, I'm just curious, do you uh, say if there are at least three goods that's foundational enough, we're good enough with that? I was just curious about the weight of that evaluation. Um, so the, the evaluations are looked at uh, at the time of opening. If there's anything below a good, that's where you have kind of a caution to try to really better understand. Um, and, you know, price is the first area of focus. And mm -hmm. then all of, the, all of the responsive and responsible elements come into play, including uh, vendor evaluations. And 
Uh, I don't know if uh, Keith Talby is on the line, if he has anything to add, but I mean, that's kind of the steps or, or Ricky, in this case, we weren't the ones administering this bill. Right. So we, and we kind of grabbed uh, the information and we did a little bit of our own due diligence on the vendors uh, to be in format with how we present these to the board. Okay. And on the project budget, this is a little bit along Frida's line of questioning. Are each of the line items, line items that we would have included? Is there anything missing or anything they added? Um, I think the, the contract structure itself lends to certain built-in line items with NIPA because of the way the funding occurs and their uh, consultants that are on board. Um, so I think we, as you notice, there's a couple more lines here than what we normally give in a project breakdown. Uh, right. But it's it's all the basics: design, construction, management, project management. Uh, in this case, we have, I believe, interest that's added here. Uh, that normally we don't show the breakdown. Payment and performance bonds are usually in our construction line, so it's it's just that we gave a little more uh, breakdown because this is really a a resolution to be in an agreement with NIPA. So we wanted to share fully uh, what the terms of that agreement are. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Um, if there are no other questions, I would like to propose a motion to um, to accept uh, this resolution for forwarding to the whole board. I will be going through each one of the members for his or her vote. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, Mitch? Yes. Uh, Frida? Yes. Sally? Yes. Um, uh, the motion, I also vote yes. Uh, the motion is carried. Um, now, Christine, the next resolution. Great, thank you. Our next resolution is authorizing New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation to the system to execute a five-year revocable license agreement with the Grace Foundation of New York, the licensee for its continued use and occupancy of 5,700 square feet of space um, in the isolation building to operate support programs for individuals affected by autism spectrum disorder and their families in New York City Health and Hospitals, uh, Seaview Hospital Rehabilitation Center, and home, the facility with the occupancy fee waived. Um, on the line with me is Matt Levy and Scott Rasno from, um, from the Seaview campus. Uh, let me give a briefing associated with the Grace Foundation, um, an amazing organization that does great work in Staten Island. The Grace Foundation is a nonprofit that formed in 2002 with the goal of improving the lives of individuals and families affected by autism spectrum disorder. Uh, ASD is a neurological disorder that impacts the development and language and communication skills, as well as social inter interaction and relatedness uh, with individuals. Uh, the this disorder is highly complex. Each person with ASD is unique and requires individualized guidance and support. Um, the Grace Foundation really provides an incredibly unique program. Uh, the members of the leadership team, they're really providing unique services that are free of charge to any individual that comes through their doors that focus on socialization, after school care, uh, events, community involvement, and things that are outside of the traditional IEP and 504 that many of us are faced with when we're figuring out the rules of the road of how to help our children that may be on the spectrum. The, the program here is, takes Medicare referrals and they serve over 300 individuals all the way from age three to four years old to 30 year old adults. Uh, they're a key member of the fabric of the community in Staten Island. Their funding just to operate is uh, predominantly coming from either donations locally as well as council and borough president and the building itself is being maintained by them on our campus, one of many buildings at Seaview uh, that, that many of which are fully closed. 
Um, here is a slide on slide three shows you a sense of the funding that is coming from them, where, how they're operating. Um, largely it's local elected funding as well as local community uh, organizations that see the benefit of such a high impact organization over the years. They, they collaborate with many, many uh, community partners as well, and they try to uh, help uh, those with ASD live their healthiest lives. Um, currently, the Grace Foundation has been at Seaview campus for 10 years. Uh, two different five-year term license agreements have been executed, and the current license agreement they have in this space expires in December of 2020. Uh, they will continue to occupy the space that they're in. Uh, I do want to point out that we do have to correct the square footage here. Uh, this was a late ad that happened this morning, so my apologies. It's uh, actually 6,900, not 5,700. Um, the entire building is 15,000, so they occupy a portion of the building. Um, we will update that in the language, but I, I did want to, that was a question that was asked when I showed the map uh, in a later slide, and we did follow up and found out there was a little bit more square footage that they're in. Um, they are committed and interested in taking referrals from health and hospitals. I mean, we don't have a hospital on Staten Island, but we do have Vanderbilt, and we do have uh, Nicole, who leads community care. So we're looking forward to collaborating with them further and seeing if there's additional synergies uh, in, in them playing a role in helping our population of patients. Um, Seaview provides uh, electricity and gas to the location. However, they maintain this building and they even have uh, investments that occur through donations to keep the facility and its surrounding area uh, in a state of good repair, which is not what we can say for some of our buildings at Seaview's campus. Just recently, the parking uh, lot had been able to get repaved with funding from elsewhere. And so the cost of the maintenance and the, and the upkeep of this building definitely uh, take into account and, and really is de minimis, you know, it's, it's much higher value compared to the cost of utilities. This is a map of uh, Seaview's campus and it might be hard to see, but to the far right uh, off Briel Avenue is where the building is, where this uh, nonprofit is occupying space uh, on Seaview's campus. So here is the uh, resolution, which I read as the slide was coming up. Um, I'm not gonna uh, reread it. I'm, I'm happy to take any questions uh, from the committee we, we felt as though this, this organization, uh, its mission very much aligns with our organization of helping everyone lead their healthiest lives and be the best they can in their community. And uh, as a mom of a child with autism spectrum disorder, I completely know that the challenges that brings to us as parents and wanting to see our, our children do the best they can and be the best they can and, and learning from others that are going through it and, and having a sense of community uh, within that uh, and advocacy for autism is just so important. And this organization really uh, has that in spades. And it's very clear they, they make a big impact for Staten Island. Thank you, Christine. Um, uh, I would like now to open the floor for the members of the board to ask any questions or any comments. I will go first with uh, Jose Pagan. Uh, thank you, Fanny. Yeah, this sounds like a, like a, like something that is well aligned with what we do, and and just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Katz. Uh, Dr. Katz, I think you were muted. Now you're. I I think. Okay. Okay. Now, yeah, sorry. Uh, no questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Frida Wang. <clears throat> um, Christine, thank you. And thank you for your comments and um, the description of the work of Grace Foundation. It really sounds like a wonderful um, organization and a good way for us to use our unused space. Is there other um, 
opportunities like this uh, we have a open you know is the rest of the building not utilized and and i think it's a great um way to try to move forward our mission that's one one question the other is i, I noted that you mentioned they are committed to taking referrals from health and hospitals is that something they've been doing um for the last 10 years and ha have we had good synergies on that front um I I think today, I don't know that we've um, organized a referral aspect. Uh, currently, you know, with Staten Island having limited health and hospitals presence, uh, the skilled nursing facility, which is definitely a leader in that area, it's not the, the same patient population that would refer over to this location. Mm -hmm. um, however, we're, we're gonna be working closely, and I hope by the time the full board meeting We'll have some bit little more clear um, opportunity for referral for our Vanderbilt clinic that's on Staten Island, as well as uh, working with our community care team for home care services to determine if there's opportunities for referral. Um, they are definitely uh, open to uh, collaborate more officially with health and hospitals. I, I'd probably guess that we probably do have some overlap already. It just hadn't been something that had been quantified. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're, we're gonna be looking at that. It, to to answer your other question about the CVU campus, there are a number of community organizations on the campus with various uh, roles that do occupy portions of our campus. We continue to try to identify opportunities for revitalization of a number of buildings. As you notice, there's a pretty large number of vacant buildings on the campus, uh, 15 through 20 are all buildings on this map here that are unoccupied buildings. Um, the, the rest of the building um, that it, where this, this location is, uh, the other portion of this building is occupied by the police surgeon. Um, and so we do have other uh, organizational presence, both public and nonprofit on the campus, as well as a couple of paying customers as well. So um, we we have two different um, detoxification centers with Camelot that one of those came before the board during right. my tenure. So so we do have kind of a combination on Seaview campus mm -hmm. of license agreements and actually uh, you know, paying rent kind of uh, scenarios. On, on that point, and do do we have a general policy on waivers of um, you know um, operating fees? And and I, I I think this is perfectly appropriate. It's not a question on Grace Foundation, but just in general, do we have a kind of you know a, a a catalog first of the of the foregone rent that we may be um, not getting, and just and then how do we think about that, both with existing ones and going forward, you know whether we continue or whether we offer. Yeah, so that's a great question. So since uh, joining, I've been working closely with Jeremy Berman and Andy Cohen's team and legal and Leora joined us this past November. And uh, Diane and Leora and Jeremy, we, we, we now have a spreadsheet that tells <laughs> us all of the, the license agreements and all of the leases and dates of expiring so that we can kind of look at that and plan um, additionally. And, and those are all of the, the things that we have as a system. And um, I don't think we have a system-wide policy per se, but I think that you're asking exactly the right question as we look to optimize our locations in all ways from a, a care environment as well as uh, uh, an environment of structure. So, so um, that is something that we are looking towards in the long term in collaboration with each of our facility leaders who also have specific needs uh, across the system. And so, um, clearly, we want to we want to make sure there's aligned goals and a, an accomplishment, a complement, and a tie into health and hospitals. Great. I think I think that would be. I, I'm I'm not surprised you already have a spreadsheet going, and I think that's um, really important to to um, put some framework around that. So thank you. Thank you, Frida.
Thank you, Frida. Um, if uh, there is no more questions, I would like I to. Just, um, uh, oh, yes. Sa Sally. Oh, sorry, Sally. <laughs> Sally, no, not sorry, 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 Sally. Okay. First, I just want to express how touched I am that notwithstanding our very severe challenges, we continue to find creative ways to provide additional critical services to our patients. Um, and Christine, your own testimonial really reinforced the important, uh, importance of this service. Um, and secondly, you don't often see nonprofits that survive from 2002 uh, with such a multiplicity of funding because clearly um, they work hard to raise their money. Uh, so really it's a testament to the management of the organization as well. Thank you, Sally. Yeah, I, I would say that um, the chair of the organization, who's the chair of the board, is a father of a high functioning son who's now in college. And he's been involved in the organization 20 years mm -hmm. and has um, just very, you know, it, it's clear that there is a long uh, history of commitment from the organization and their mission. And that I would agree that it, it really, uh, it's a testament to the organization itself. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, uh, Christine. Um, uh, is there any other comments? Uh, so let me just um, uh, propose a motion to approve this resolution to, for submission to the board. I will poll each member individually. Uh, Jose Pagan? Yes. Dr. Katz? Yes. Frida Wang? Frida? I think you're muted. I'm muting, yes. Yes. Uh, Sally Hernandez Pinheiro? Yes. Uh, the motion is carried. Uh, now, uh, from the remaining of the uh, meeting, I will uh, recuse uh, myself and Chair Jose Pagan will continue to chair this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Uh, our next resolution, uh, Oscar Gonzalez and I think. Uh, for this resolution, I'm going to be recusing myself, and Oscar Gonzalez will be presenting this resolution. Thank you. I'll, I'll return. Thank you. Uh, Oscar. Good morning. Uh, my name is Oscar Gonzalez. Oh, my name is Oscar Gonzalez, Assistant Vice President of OFD. On the phone should be. Mahanjana Indar, also known as Menji, uh, Senior Director of OFD. Uh, and we're here to um, uh, request to execute uh, exterior envelope requirement contracts um, for seven architectural and engineering consulting firms. A quick overview, um, H&H &H requires professional architectural engineering design and construction related services on an as needed basis for projects throughout the systems that are related to the exterior envelopes of our buildings. Uh, these services include facade projects, roofing and roofing related work, uh, such, as such as parapet walls, uh, window assembly, and local law 11 compliance. The current contracts in place are sim uh, for similar services previously referred to as local law 11 uh, will expire on December 2020 this year. Uh, the current spend for facade services is 6,284,138 to date. Um, uh, the quick little back, quick background, uh, DOB has asked H&H &H to develop a systemic plan to address the historical local law 11 violations and to schedule the cycle seven and eight required inspections. Uh, one of our consultants, uh, Superstructures, had an existing database uh, of health and hospital buildings, uh, and they've met with DOB on h and hs behalf to update the Local Law 11 universe. Um, this uh, included updating the building addresses, uh, dismissing aged violations, address current violations. Of the six point, nearly 6.3 million spent to date, there. Uh, there is 6,050,298 approved the work orders assigned to superstructures alone on file to investigate 
and to do corrective infrastructure work in our facilities. With the help of superstructures and Elizabeth Youngbar, uh, one of our team members, uh, uh, we were able to reduce our outstanding violations from 250 violations down to 110, but there's still a lot of work remaining to do. The criteria for the RFP um, was a MWB uh, utilization plan, minimum of five years of satisfactory uh, comparable services to health uh, healthcare facilities, um, licensed professional to hold New York State licenses. Uh, the substantive uh, criteria was 25% approach and methodology, 25% uh, appropriateness and quality of the firm's experience, 25% of the quality, uh, quality, excuse me, qualifications of proposers, consultants, and staffing, 15% of the status of the MWB utilization plan, and 10% of the cost. Uh, the committee involved two representatives from OFC and uh, uh, a representative from Metropolitan, Kings, Jacoby, and EIT EITS. Overview of the procurement timeline included uh, CRC approved uh, an application to issue solicitation last year on October 15th. Uh, on January 9th, an RFP was sent directly to vendors and posted on city record. On January 16th, uh, there was a mandatory pre-proposal conference call where 33 vendors attended. Uh, the deadline for the proposals was January 31st. We received 21 proposals. Um, all the proposals obtained a MWBE utilization plan, uh, which would, were very robust. Um, and on March 12th, the evaluation committee uh, reviewed the proposals and we scored them and we had a natural break of the scoring where we invited 12 a and &E vendors to come in and present to the evaluation committee. Uh, out of those 12, two of them were uh, MWB uh, shortlisted firms. Uh, there was a slight delay uh, after that uh, to, to uh, the current situation. Um, but on July 13th, uh, vendor presentations and, and the evaluation committee's uh, um, uh, scoring occurred. So as a result, uh, we're seeking to enter into contract uh, with the seven architectural firms related to exterior envelope. Uh, uh, these are the firms listed. Um, they are, uh, for, uh, I'll just go through the names real quick. Um, architectural Preservation Studio, also known as APS, H2M, Hoffman Architects, Lothrop Associates, Urban Architects, Renette Riley Architects, and Superstructures. All of them with very good ratings, um, uh, good, excellent, uh, satisfactory uh, for uh, exterior envelope related work throughout our throughout the city on multiple different agencies. Um, so we're requesting to enter into a three-year contract with uh, two one-year options to renew, uh, effective no later than January first. Um, Total pool contract value of 10 million and uh, uh, the 30% utilization plan has been submitted by all vendors. On the next slide, it'll show you the, um, the list of all the subcontractors uh, provided by the vendors and it totals to a 52, um, uh, 52 uh, MWB vendors that will be utilized by these uh, prime contractors. So the resolution, um, sorry, uh, we're authorizing the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation, New York City Health and Hospitals, to negotiate and execute requirement contracts with seven architectural and engineering a &E consulting firms, namely Architectural Preservation Studio, DCP, H2M Architects and Engineers, Hoffman Architects Incorporated, Lothrop Associates LLP Architects, Renette Riley Architect, Superstructures Engineering and Architecture, Urban Architects DCP, to provide professional A&E design services related to exterior facade projects on an as-needed basis at various facilities throughout the corporation. The contract shall be for a term of three years with two one-year options for renewal solely exercisable by New York City Health and Hospitals uh, for a cumulative amount not to exceed 10 million 
for services provided by all such consultants. Any questions? Thank you, Oscar. Uh, I'll, I'll go through committee members now. Dr. Katz, any questions? Dr. Katz, any questions? You're muted. Sorry, having trouble with the mute button. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Katz. Uh, Frida Wang, question? Any questions? Uh, no questions. Thank you. Uh, Sally Landes, Pinero. Uh, Sally, any questions? Okay, so let me then. Uh, Sally, are you there? Sally's trying to talk. Sally, we can't okay. hear you. Sally, we can mute yourself, Sally. We cannot hear you, Sally. Again. Can you hear now. me now? Yes. Okay. I have um, a question about this. And it's that, like, we hire seven firms for a very modest amount of money, $6 million. And we have a pipeline of work that's still outstanding. And so I, I wonder, going through this whole process of picking them and everything, isn't there a way to kind of have a little pipeline of work approved that is still contingent, where funding is still contingent, but where you don't have to go through this whole process of selecting the firms and approving the firms? Um, I, I, I mean, it's, it's just a question. It's just such a modest amount of money. Um, and we do have a lot of work still to be done. Agreed, there is a lot of work. Um, just, just, to, just for semantics, uh, the, the contract value is for 10 million. But oh, these okay. are for, consul for consulting services. So these are you know, to bring uh, consultants on boards, do the assessments, do the surveys, do the full designs. Um, right. Typically, the design consulting, it's about 10% of the project cost. Um, so ultimately, we're going to need to find that funding for the construction part of this. Um, so, if, if you want to make some uh, an easy translation, if ten percent, if ten million dollars is ten percent typically of of the construction value, yeah, uh, you're looking at about a hundred million dollars worth of work. So, um, yeah, so it, it's it, it's a, I would say it's a, it's a significant amount of work for consultants, uh, but not necessarily for contractors. So you, okay. and, and, and also the other thing I want to mention is it's important to have the, the consultants on board because um, if we don't have these requirement contracts on board, then we would have to do a uh, standalone uh, procurement each and every time. Yeah, I, I wish we could do more, you know, contract for a greater scope of work at one time. But if it doesn't, yeah. work, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah, the other the other the, the uh, issue with this is um, you know having to get capital eligibility when it comes to exterior envelope. Um, there is very strict parameters as to what's capitally eligible or not. Um, if we're if we're updating or upgrading the entire facade of a building, that's pretty simple. That's pretty cap That's pretty much capitally eligible. Otherwise, they give us a hard time trying to decipher what's a significant amount of work, what's contiguous amount of work versus repair. So mm -hmm. if we're just repairing, um, they really uh, scrutinize uh, our, our, our involvement there. So it, it, it becomes a little bit more of a harder lift. Okay, thank you. No problem. Thank you, Oscar. Um, you know, actually uh, what, Sally, what you brought up may be a, an interesting conversation to have with Christine and Fanny. Uh, uh, Yes. Uh, just to see, you know, if there are ways in which some of those ideas could, you know, could be considered. Um, and I just wanted to say, uh, Oscar, uh, uh, very impressed with how, uh, um, you know, all these firms pre presented MWB plans at thirty percent, and and uh, it's 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 uh, yeah, it's nice to see that. You know that that we're doing that in a very systematic way. So, um, so any let's, let's there, there, uh, was, there, there, there was one thing that I think I forgot to mention. Um, 
out of the seven firms selected, there were two of them that are MWBE uh, mm. uh, that are going to be serving as prime. Um, one of them, Renette Riley, who's who's done work with us before, uh, but APS has not done work any, uh, with us, and and they did a very good job with the proposal and with the presentation. Uh, thank you, Oscar. So let's vote on the resolution. So, uh, Dr. Katz. Yes. Yes. Uh, Frida Juan. Yes. Sally Hernandez Pinheiro. Yes. And uh, Jose Pagan. Yes. So the resolution carries. Let's move to the next one. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Oscar. Um, and Christine. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I know Christine has joined us and we're going to, to partner in this effort um, to discuss the express care. So Christine, do you want to kick it off or would you like me to get started? No, go ahead, Evan A. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, first, I'd just like to thank Christine and her team. Um, Dr. Katz, we've thanked you publicly and members of our board, we have as well. But I think that what OFD has been able to do and the support that they've been able to provide to us has been nothing short of really miraculous. And you've just done a phenomenal job, Christine and team. So I just want to say that. Thank you. Um, so our, our district project, and it is a part of uh, the district funding umbrella is around creation of an urgent care uh, attached to New York City Health and Hospitals Harlem. It will be directly adjacent to our current emergency department. And one of the reasons we find this to be so important is many years later, and we're just now really able to secure the funds and design. But why we find this to be important is because we currently have a fast track program in our emergency department that sees around 25,000 people, including um, about 10,000 children. So we wanted to make sure that we had a location that was separate and apart from the main emergency department that would allow for people to be able to access care um, in a safe space, but also so that the providers could focus on those that had high acuity. And in speaking to our emergency providers, they really shared that sometimes the disproportionate amount of back and forth that they have as physicians going from someone who's very, very ill, um, hemodynamically unstable to someone who's got you know, a sprained ankle or who they're looking at for, for very, very mild asthma treatment, it's very difficult for them to navigate. And so clinically, we know that there's great support for express care. We understand the business case because of the proliferation of city MDs around express care. Um, and for us, we're just very excited because one of the ways that we've designed this is also to be a patient education center, to make sure that people who continue to have readmission problems or um, who have unnecessary or avoidable admissions really have somewhere to go. Go. Um, and if for us, we need to be realistic that for our patients, ambulatory care is not always the place that they want to receive care based on their utilization statistics. So while we are working on access and NYC care, I think having um, a hybrid kind of space where people can really access care, ask their questions, get their prescriptions refilled um, is really the right way, the right way to proceed. Um, so I'll stop there because I know that the case for urgent care is appreciated by most um, and see if there are any questions, or perhaps, Christine, if you want to talk more about the construction aspect, that would be fine also. So I, I think if there's any specific questions for Ms. Carrington, who does a great job leading Harlem Hospital, um, if there's any specifics to the clinical care, really appreciate you joining us on your day off, Evan A. Um, and, and being <laughs> able to come to the table to, to really articulate well the needs of Harlem, we appreciate it. Um, I can go into the design and construction piece. Uh, do any members of the committee have questions specific for Ebene? Um, go ahead. Uh, I can't I hear guess. you, Sally. Sally, you want to say something? Just um, there's a sentence that says, as an extension of the hospital's ambulatory care practice. By, managed by the emergency department. Could you um, expand on that? Sure, um, and that's probably my fault in just a nomenclature. So when we talk about a hybrid, when you look at express care, you basically have a very low acuity population of patients, mm -hmm. specifically those that would be seen in a clinic. Um, however, either for so psychosocial issues or just because of preference, they choose not to engage in primary care consistently. 
Um, these are people who are using our emergency department, of course, at a much higher cost than necessary. And to the point of the providers that I was making, really making it difficult to navigate between very, very acute care that's needed in an emergency setting versus someone who's just come for something less acute. And we know this because when you come to an emergency department, um, your triage status or your ESI level is about how many resources are going to be necessary to care for you. And when you have ESIs in the four and five category, it's very, very basic. It means a nurse or a doctor can care for you, um, a provider or an extender can care for you. And so while we call it um, an extension of the ambulatory care practice is because these are very low acuity patients. However, the emergency physicians will be the ones that are credentialed to care for and to provide the treatment for these patients. Um, as well. And so what we found is that by having a board certified emergency physician who has the ability to really see and treat you very quickly and, and do a, a head to toe assessment, if there is a higher level of care necessary, you're going right around the corner. You're actually wheeled to the main emergency department. So it's better to have that um, that skill set than just a family practitioner um, and the ability for patients to actually be linked to care is what makes this one so um, I, I think so new and nuanced in its design is that we and I think that's why we got the money quite frankly because we were always very patient centric in our approach to the education and to appreciating the causal factors to why they kept coming to an ED. And there's nothing in terms of the amount of time that's taken there that we can really use to address why they're coming to an emergency department. But in express care, there's a discharge hub, there's a social worker, there's some AMCARE patient, um, some AMCARE staff to intake you, some managed care staff sitting there to enroll you if you were under or uninsured. And so for us, this is really the nice and the right bridge to helping people get from going to the emergency department to the clinic. Um, our population is really kind of hot and cold. They go to the ED or they don't go anywhere. And so we think that express care is actually a way to engage folks into um, the care delivery system. And by talking with them about what they need, their chronic diseases and getting them linked to an appointment quickly and timely, we, we hope that that's an engagement strategy. So, so for us, this is just a plan that brings a lot of components of our strategic plan together. Okay, thank you very much, Ebony. You're welcome. Thank you, Ebony. Thank you for being so attuned to what the community needs and, and, and it's like a very interesting project. So. Um, okay. uh, Christine? So this uh, project was completed its design in the spring and it went out to bid uh, just as COVID was getting a little better in our system. And uh, so this was an incredibly active, robust uh, amount of vendors that downloaded the design documents and uh, bid openings involved 17 different bidders. Uh, it was a record breaking bid opening. And our lowest bidder here was Turner Construction, and they had a 42% MWBE subcontractor utilization plan with a number of subcontractors that actually have participated in a number of emergency contracts during COVID as well. Um, so the contract amount here with the bid is $5 million. The MWBE participation is over $2 million. And the project is expected to be completed in 2021. Uh, evaluations of Turner construction here have uh, turned up in mocks, both excellent and good uh, by Department of Design and Construction. And Turner Construction is our construction manager uh, for EDC at our Coney Island uh, CSS building, the major project happening there with our Sandy FEMA funds. And they did provide us a number of emergency uh, surge projects uh, over the course of COVID. And uh, I would highlight uh, some of the work that Oscar did with them associated with turning hundreds of beds that were behavioral health into low acuity hospital beds at Kings County, as well as a large body of work at Coney Island Hospital specifically for surge. So um, Turner Construction is a known entity. Uh, to health and hospitals, as well as other parts of the city. Next slide. Uh, this shows you the project budget. This is an example of um, essentially us having currently a relatively high project contingency because our bid environment was so competitive. And so we were below the engineer's estimate for the project. This allows us to, this is the value of the district grant of $9.6 million. And it shows you uh, the cost breakdown between uh, design, construction management, construction, EITS, as well as the project contingency. Next slide. So 
So this resolution is requesting authorizing the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation, NYC Health and Hospitals, to execute a contract with Turner Construction Corporation, the contractor, for an amount not to exceed $5,095,551 for construction services necessary for the emergency department reconfiguration, aka the build out of the new express care at New York City Health and Hospitals, Harlem Hospital Center, the facility, with other contracts associated with this project totaling $1,882,022, including architectural engineering services and a 28% project contingency of $2,659,176 for unexpected changes in scope, yielding a total authorized expenditure of $9,636,750. We're happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you, Christine. Uh, any questions, Dr. Katz? Uh, Dr. Katz? Uh, Frida Wang, any questions? Um, Christine, I just had one question on the contingency. It's a 28% contingency. Is that, a, it seems, a higher number than we've seen? In I don't have context for that, but. So um, we had an engineer's estimate that was substantially higher uh, ahead of this bid, um, I think 10 to 18% higher than where the bid came in. As I mentioned, this uh, bid came out, uh, I believe it was June, July. And so it was right when um, I would say there, there still is a very large volume of contractors bidding our work. And so this was an incredibly competitive uh, bid that that allowed us to all of a sudden have a larger contingency than we normally ever would have. Got it. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Sally hernandez Pinero. Uh, I don't even know if I'm on or off, but <laughs> I'll right. I just want to say it's, uh, you have Turner on, on a very modest contract for them, and the 42% uh, MWBE uh, representation is terrific. Yes, uh, we're excited. Thank you, Sally. Uh, Christine, uh, with with COVID, you know, the, this project has a completion date of 2021. Is that impact, does that impact uh, the timeline for the project? So I think that uh, we will see. I think our, you know, the the how we do construction is clear with uh, social distancing and masks. Those guidelines are all in place. Turner Construction is incredibly uh, aware of all of those requirements. Uh, there has been industry wide a, a recognition uh, for future construction that there is a productivity factor of potentially five to ten percent. However. Uh, we are confident in, in our builders and ensuring they know all the rules and the regs and they move forward. What I can anticipate is, you know, what will happen for uh, additional patients uh, coming to the hospital and if there's a need in that way. But um, but we, we hope that this can be completed by 2021. I think uh, larger work was completed within um, 30 days during the emergency. So I think this is possible. Okay, thank uh, you. Chair, Chair. Chair Pagan, we also have several projects going on as we speak at the hospital. And so what we found is that their, um, their infection control processes and practices are very strong. We haven't seen any degradation in the timeline or any slippage. Um, and so working in very strong collaboration with our facilities team that's doing a, a very strong job of helping to coordinate. We don't find that this to be rate limiting. Excellent, thank you so much. So let's vote on the resolution then, uh, Dr. Katz. Yes. Uh, Frida Wang? Yes. Sally Hernandez Pinero? Yes. Sally? Ah. I'm sorry. Oh, gosh. Here are you, Sally. Yes, yes. Yes. And Jose Bagan, yes. Thank you so much. Uh, any old business to come before the committee? Any new business? If there's no old or new business, the, there's no further discussion. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you.